Section 4.2 is titled Friction. We've identified two types of friction that are present in our universe. Number one, static friction. This is given the symbol F with a subscript S for static. Keep in mind that this represents the friction that is present on objects that are stationary. A force of friction that prevents two surfaces from sliding. Kinetic friction is given the symbol F with a K. Subscript K comes from the Greek word kinema. Kinema meaning motion. This is the force of friction exerted on a moving object by a surface opposite to the direction of the motion. We compared static and kinetic friction and we used the example of a stalled car. We said the force required to get the stalled car into motion was significantly greater than the force required to keep the car moving. We explained this by stating that the force of static friction is significantly greater in all circumstances than the force of kinetic friction. So let's just summarize that example by stating that in order to start an object, in order to start an object into motion, a large force is needed to overcome friction. In the case when the object is already moving, a smaller force is required to keep it moving in order to overcome kinetic friction. So let me reword it this way. In order to keep an object moving, a comparatively smaller force is required to overcome kinetic friction. I almost wrote. All right, so there are two equations to calculate static friction and kinetic friction. If you look at them, they're almost the same, except for their subscripts. We use the subscript S for static friction, and we use the subscript K for kinetic friction. The symbol that you see here is the Greek letter mu, and we use this symbol to represent the coefficient of friction. And this depends on the surfaces.
The second symbol that you see is the normal force. And you need to remember this, and I'm going to rewrite it again. We are going to be looking at objects that are resting on a level surface. Whenever an object rests on a level surface, you can calculate the normal force by calculating the force of gravity. Because on a level surface, the normal force is equal to or equivalent to the force of gravity. So on a level surface, whenever an object is resting on a level surface, the normal force is equal to gravity. So whenever you see the normal force here, keep in mind that you're going to be plugging in mg. On page 170, you'll find table 1. Table 1, I want you to take a look at it, lists several coefficients. So taking a look on page 170, table number 1, we have listed several common coefficients. And we're going to compare the values between two surfaces for both static friction and kinetic friction. So first we'll look at wood on dry snow, 0 0.22 for static friction and 0 0.18 for kinetic friction. This is an important example, especially if you're interested in skiing or creating skis out of wood or a toboggan for that matter. So you want to be able to calculate the amount of friction and reduce it as much as possible. Notice that the coefficient for static friction is greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. And this is always the case. There's always more friction going to be calculated for a static situation than there will be for a kinetic situation. Now, if the snow were wet, that means if it rained or if there were water in the snow, then the value for the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.14, and for kinetic, it would be 0 0.10. Again, showing that always greater for static than for kinetic. And in this case, less friction than if the snow were dry. The third example that we have is for synovial joints in humans. Each of your joints in your bones is an area that moves continuously. And if you have, or if you're involved in vigorous exercise, for example, if you're a runner or an athlete, you want to make sure that there is no friction between your joints if you are involved in vigorous exercise. So it is imperative that the human body has an almost frictionless situation happening in all of its joints. If there ever is friction, what happens is you get inflammation, where the bone is rubbing against the other bone, causing the area to become inflamed. We call this inflammation of the joints arthritis. So. If we take a look at the values for synovial fluids, the static coefficient of friction is 0 0.01, and the kinetic coefficient for synovial fluid in the joints of humans is 0 0.003, a remarkably amazing low level of friction between these joints. And thankfully, so we're allowed to, or able to, involve ourselves in vigorous exercise. Taking a look at sample problem number one, we have a three kilogram block of wood. Which is sitting on a rough surface. Which is a wooden floor in this case. The object's at rest. If I want to get this object into motion, I have to apply a force of at least 14.7 newtons 
in order to overcome static friction. If I have to apply a force of 14.7 newtons, and this is my applied force, <coughs> in order to overcome static friction, then what must the force of static friction be? It's going to be in the backward direction, and what will its value be? Simon? Good. 14.7. So in this question, they tell you that in order to get this object into motion, you must apply a force of 14.7 in order to overcome static friction. Our job is to calculate the coefficient of static friction, mu s. Looking at our equation, it's equal to the force of static friction over the normal force. So we've determined that the force of static friction is 14.7 newtons. What do I put in for the normal force? How do I calculate that? Well, remember, on a level surface, and this is the case for this example, the normal force is equal to the force of gravity. Bless you. So in this case, we're going to be putting in mass, which is 3 kilograms, times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Punch this in and tell me what the coefficient for static friction is for this wooden block resting on this wooden floor. Give me your answer to two sig digs. If you punch this in, you should get a value of 0 0.50. No units, no direction, completely scalar quantity. Now, once the object is moving, if this individual were to let go, the object would eventually come to rest because there's still friction. But in order to keep it moving, you must apply a force of 8.8 .8 newtons. That means that just to keep it moving, you must be overcoming kinetic friction, which is present. If you're applying a force of 8.8 .8 newtons to keep it moving, then that implies that the force of kinetic friction is 8.8 .8 newtons back. So in this example, we want to find the force of kinetic friction. The equation is almost identical, except we have different subscripts. So this is force of kinetic friction over the normal force. Since the mass is not changed, the normal force will be the same. The only thing that will be different is the force of kinetic friction. So we have 8.8 .8 newtons divided by 3 kilograms times 9.8 .8 newtons per kilogram because we remember that the normal force is equal to the force of gravity because these objects are resting on a level surface. Punch these into your calculator, and you should get a value of 0 0.30 for the coefficient of kinetic friction. If we place a second object on top of the first object, it's going to increase the force of gravity, which pushes down on the first object. And therefore, it'll also increase the force with which the surface pushes up on the original object. This should result in increased friction. From part A, we determined that the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.50. And we want to determine the force of static friction. So using our equation, the coefficient of static friction is equal to the force of static friction over the normal force. We can rearrange this equation and say that the force of static friction is equal to the coefficient times the normal force. Since this object is resting on a level surface, we know that the normal force is equal to mg. So we can write the force of static friction is equal to the coefficient times mg. If we sub and solve, we put in 0 0.50 times the sum of these two forces, or the sum of these two masses, rather, 2.1 kilograms 
plus 3.0 kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Punch this into your calculator and give me the force of static friction to two significant digits. You should get 25 newtons. So the force of static friction has increased from 14.7 newtons to 25 newtons because there is an additional mass placed on top. This is going to push down on the object, causing the surface to push up on the object with an increased force. In part B, the question asks, if a horizontal force of 6.8 newtons east acts on the block, will this block move and explain? Well, we know that limiting static friction is 14.7 newtons. If the minimum force required to get this object to move is 14.7 newtons, and we apply a force of 6.8, is it going to move? No. So we need to come up with a statement something like this. Since the limiting force of static friction is 14.7 newtons west, a force of 6.8 newtons east is insufficient to start the block into motion. For tonight's homework, you're going to revisit page 171, 1 to 3, and page 172, 1 to 3, and 5 to 7. Attempt to answer these questions, and we'll be taking up some of this homework tomorrow.